thanks everyone for, for coming out. This is really a special day. Um, we talked about this uh, last spring and so many people said, well, that is just a really great idea. Uh, haven't you all been very curious about what it looks like on the inside? Yes. Uh, this was brought about because we had to replace the stained glass window uh, that was in the mausoleum. About 40 years ago, uh, vandals came through the cemetery and they broke the window that was in the mausoleum. And up till now, it really just had a piece of plastic in that window and we really felt that the Ferrises deserved to have the very best that we could possibly give them. Mm -hmm. So we decided to embark on this project. And it really was a project that we've been doing for about a year and a half to refurbish the mausoleum. And we had the exterior recocked and we did some cleaning and cleaned on the inside and it's just really special and we just wanted to share it uh, with everyone. Uh, there's some members here of the History Task Force who have worked on this project, especially Jennifer Thede over here and Mary Eustace. Thank you so much ladies for coordinating this event. Yeah. We, do, we have some other members here today as well. Jeff Gabalas works on our, on our committee. And who else do we have here today? Uh, Karen, someone over there works on our committee. Thank you so much. Melinda. Yep. Where? Melinda, where are you? There she is. She helps uh, lead quite a few of the projects. Um, I would also like to take some time to thank Mark Eichenberg. He has been such a, a great leader for us. Anytime we come up with these wild projects, he says, yep, no problem, you know, we'll take care of it. And he steps up and he works with uh, the stained glass artists and helps us get this all taken care of and we really appreciate that. Uh, Jim White, uh, who is a staff member at the physical plant, wave your hand. <laughs> Jim, thank you so much. He he oversees and takes care of the mausoleum during the year. He keeps it clean and uh, brings to our attention anything that, that we need to take care of. And I appreciate that so much. And he tells me how proud he is to be able to take care of this for our founders. Uh, Will Gasper and his crew they take care of planting the urns and taking care of the landscaping and thank you so very much uh, for doing that. And also, I would like to thank President Eisler because he supports all the projects that we do and he shows up like a trooper and comes and speaks uh, when we ask him to. <laughs> but if you think about this gathering today, this group of people all brought together by the lives of two individuals. Uh, people who created something's extraordinary. When you come come to a cemetery, there's a tendency to talk talk and think about death, but I'd, I'd encourage you to think about life and what Woodbridge and Helen Ferris created here in Big Rapids with, with Ferris Institute and Ferris State University. As, as I was coming over here, I was walking across our quad, and you know, now we have a beautiful July day at the end of August. <laughs> and, but to see the students walking across our campus, you know, headed to class, uh, very much engaged in their education. And think how this all derived from the vision of a man and his wife who came to Big Rapids in 1884 to create a school of opportunity, to create the opportunity of education for people that education had missed. And it's, it's something that you feel when you join Ferris State University, you feel the the wisdom of our founders, the vision of our founders, and they they have an impact on our institution in a way that few universities anywhere are fortunate to enjoy. So as we're here in the cemetery, I encourage you to just reflect back on the wonderful difference that both Woodbridge and Helen Ferris have made for Ferris State University and for the city of Big Thank you, President Eisler. We also have with us today a very special guest, and uh, this is our stained glass campus artist. did a lot of restoration, spent about six months there. Uh, and then in town here, Emanuel Lutheran Church, uh, we created four stained glass windows, and that was probably about a year and a half ago, I think, that that was completed. In doing this window, I always like to research a little bit uh, what I'm doing, okay, and who I'm doing it for. 
And I know that uh, Woodridge and Helen were obviously amazing people, uh, like the president pointed out. I mean, they, here's a man who had an idea that became this university. It's uh, uh, you know amazing and to think that he was born in a log cabin in upstate New York uh, and just came here to all places, Big Rapids, not that it's not a great place, <laughs> and started this amazing thing. The, the thing I want to point out is that uh, stained glass, I've traveled a little bit out east and uh, have a brother who graduated from Yale and was able to go to Yale and look at some of the stained glass. Actually, Tiffany had done some of the stained glass there. Uh, and, you know, Ivy League schools, we think of stained glass, it's kind of the mystique of the school. And so I think it's very fitting that we would honor uh, this family with stained glass. Now, one of the concerns was how do we make this look authentic? And kind of our thought was that 100 years from day, today, our goal is that people will come and look at it and think it was done in 1928. So the glass uh, that used in this came from a few different companies in the US that still make what's called opalescent glass. And you've probably seen this type of glass before. It has kind of a milky appearance. It's translucent as opposed to transparent. Uh, but one of the companies I want to measure, uh, mention that actually uh, some of the glass in the window is made by is called, and this kind of a tongue twister, but it's Kokomo Opalescent Glass Factory in Kokomo, Indiana. <laughs> and it started in 1888 uh, because someone discovered there's a lot of natural gas in that part of Indiana. And they went, wow, we could make glass here. There's a lot of fuel. And so they created a business that still exists today. Uh, and some of the glass that I'm pretty sure originally would have been used to create the Victorian window that was broken out by the vandals would have come from Kokomo. And so some of the glass used in that, the opalescent glass, is in this window. Uh, the, as far as the design, uh, actually Mary Kay researched what had been in existence back when it was Ferris Institute, I believe, uh, in the 1800s. And we, we, you know, she got a hold of some images uh, and found out that, hey, you know, there's a torch that's part of the insignia of the university. And there was a torch back then, too, so it kind of follows uh, that we decided to use as a symbol a torch. And we, we really kind of, I used artistic license, which Mary Kay said it would be okay. And we kind of changed it because we were saying, well, what would have been here when Woodridge and Helen, what would they have chosen? And obviously they wouldn't have chosen the exact flame that's on it, but we did that. We took the, like on this gentleman's shirt, that really beautiful flame image and incorporated it into the window and then combined some of the background that we found, which was like a diamond pattern, diamond paint, which goes way back to Europe in the early times of stained glass and incorporated that. And then the pillars, so these I believe are Ionic Roman pillars. The Greeks had like flutes in their pillars. Uh, and I also incorporated that into the window to frame it out to have a lintel. And the glass used in that is actually the glass from Kokomo. And what's interesting about opalescent glass uh, is it takes on many characteristics one of them is that it can look a lot like marble. So we just simply used glass that has a marble-like appearance for all the surround, which is the stone. Uh, and then the last element actually is a nameplate. Uh, and if you've gone to Europe and seen the great Gothic cathedrals, you'll notice that there are hands and faces of apostles and Christ and all these symbolism. Uh, and many times people think that those faces are actually made out of separate pieces. But actually, most of the time, uh, they're made out of one piece of glass that has been hand painted and then fired in a kiln and the temperature, I'll tell you a secret, is 1,255 degrees, if you ever want to do this. Uh, <laughs> and the glass actually is, has, has glass, or the paint actually has glass in it. It's called Grisal which I'm probably pronouncing improperly, it's a French word. Uh, 
and it means gray, okay? And so the paint that was used to create those windows is the same paint we used to create the nameplate in here. So it's a permanent process. It'd be very similar to your familiar ceramics. Ceramics have a glaze that's put on and fired. Well, that's what we did there. So it's very permanent. It's gonna last for many, many years. You're absolutely welcome to come forward and take a look. And if you'd like to talk to the artist, he'll be here. There was a Pitch Phelps, the Phelps Free Library was I am not sure I'm thinking I'm not thinking so wrong. I'm not sure. Is it? Is it? Is it? We'll have to ask, we'll have to ask Mark to see if he's okay. Okay. But one of the things I think is that the roof of the church is the camp house. We paid us in wood cash. Oh, oh. it's one. Yeah. 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 And Mark Reed and, and, and Charles Carlton. Carlton on this side. There's one not Mark, so I assume there's one empty. I'd have sworn that uh, the Ferris has had a third son who died as a child and was buried in Illinois. And I'd swear that I read somewhere that he was brought here and put in the mausoleum. Well, maybe he's with his mother. That's possible. Could be. Could be. It was nice to put the description of the Yes, yes, yes.